Well, as Paul mentioned, uh, I spent my aim time in Bolivia. And when I was in Bolivia, uh, I worked at this children's home. And every day we would uh, go through lunch. We'd go through the lunch line and get our food. And, of course, I was at the end of the line. And whenever the lunch lady saw me, she would fill my plate. She would give me an unholy amount of food, just <laughs> dumping food on there. And I would beg and plead her. I'd say, please don't give me that much food. I can't eat it. And in Bolivia, you're expected to eat all the food you're given. And I was like, please stop. I can't eat it. And, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was soup or rice or whatever. She would pile it on. And I was kind of offended. I thought, this lady must think I'm enormous. She must think I'm just some sort of behemoth who can't be filled with enough food. And so I was honestly kind of offended. And towards the end of my field time, I, I was talking slash complaining to my coordinator, who was the missionary who worked there. And I was just telling him, man, I, I never can, ba I can barely walk out of that place because I'm so full. They won't stop giving me so much food. They must just think I'm a giant. And he told me that in Bolivia, and it might be common in other Latin American countries as well, but when people give you food, when they give you more and more food, that's how they honor you. They're saying, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. We appreciate what you're doing. So I was begging and pleading with her not to honor me, but she was honoring me nevertheless. I, I completely missed that, and that's because honor can be expressed in a multitude of different ways, right? Especially across different cultures. I think to yourself, what is honor? It might take you a second, especially because honor can overlap with encourage one another and serve one another. Those things are kind of wrapped up in one. So the purpose of this lesson will be to get a clearer understanding of what it means to honor one another. And we'll be doing that through looking at what honor is, the purpose of honor, the why, the people we honor, the who, and the practice of honor, the how. <clears throat> to begin, let's get a working definition of honor. What is honor? Quite simply, and this is what we'll be using throughout our sermon, is Vines defines honor to honor as to glorify or to value to glorify or to value. So keep that in your mind as we go through, because that's kind of the lens we're going to be looking at honor through. Well, okay, great. To honor is to value or glorify someone. But why bother? Why do we honor? Why does Paul in Romans tell us to honor one another? Well, first and foremost, we honor all of humanity because all of us are made in God's image. Every human is made in God's image, and for that, they're worthy of honor, because through that, we honor God. But we honor one another. We honor our brothers and sisters because Jesus, because God, first honored us. God valued us so much that he sent his son to die. That's how much we're worth to him. That's why we honor one another, because God honored us first by making us in his image, and dying for us. He bought us with a price. Well, who do we honor? I think the short answer is everyone, but that wouldn't make for a very good lesson. So we're going, we're going to highlight a few people that we honor. First and foremost, and this is why I had David sing the song that he did, obviously we honor God, right? In John chapter 5, verses 20 through 22, through 23, <clears throat> Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And Paul further writes in 1 Corinthians, For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Other versions may say, Honor God. In your body. And that brings it back to the point that we honor God because He bought us, because we were bought with a price. Well, if we're going to honor one another, it needs to start with the family, right? 
if you're like me, when you heard <clears throat> honor one another, you may have thought, honor your father and mother, right? That's one of the first commands that we can adequately follow as children. We honor our father and mother. And that's not only when we honor our father and mother, right? We honor them throughout our whole lives. And we honor them when we're children and to an extent when we're adults by obeying them, right? But also further on in life, as is depicted in this picture, we honor them by taking care of them as they've taken care of us. And I understand that looks different in different cultures and in different families, but that's one way, two ways that we can honor one another. When I was preparing for this lesson, and let me tell you, I really struggled with this lesson, uh, I met with Kevin to talk about this, and what Kevin told me is this. He said, the best thing you can tell me about my kids is that they're walking with the Lord. We honor our parents by honoring the Father, by walking with Him. We also honor our spouses. Picture this, I'm sure it's not hard to picture. How often have you seen, or maybe unfortunately been a part of, groups that bash their spouses? Maybe just for a laugh, or maybe to vent, or they're angry, or whatever. It's really common. Maybe because it's, we feel like it's easy, or maybe because we see other people doing it. But that's not at all how we're supposed to treat our spouses. Peter writes, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And I don't believe that only is limited to husbands. Wives, husbands need honor, need respect as well. We need to be people, we need to be husbands and wives who speak only good things of our spouses, whether they are around and especially when they're not. And we'll talk more in the how about how else we can honor our spouses. Here's the tough one. Political leaders. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. You might be saying, you don't know our political leaders. Our political leaders are this or that. They don't agree with me. They do this. They are criminals, whatever else. Do you know who was the honor? Excuse me. Do you know who was the emperor when Peter wrote? His name was Nero. And he was, by every account, an awful, awful ruler. A man who hated his people who hated his family, and thought himself to be God, and killed Christians if they refused to worship him. Regardless of what you think of our leaders, as a nation, we've truly been blessed. We have never had a leader who has lined us up and told us to either curse our God or meet lions in an arena, or told us to worship him or watch our children die. And if God, through Peter, can tell the Christians to honor that man, I think we can honor ours as well. Another example in Jude, verses 8 and 9. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Don't get lost in the details of whatever was going on at this point. The point is that the archangel, not just an angel, the archangel Michael, who was face to face with the evil one, the prince of darkness, the prince of lies, the enemy, the accuser, whatever you want to call him, Satan himself, didn't insult him, didn't rebuke, didn't rebuke him. He said, that's up to God. God rebuke you. And I think we need to do the same. We need to leave the cursing up to God. Take a look at your Facebook posts, Instagram posts, 
your speech, whatever, are you honoring our political leaders? Our church leaders are deserving of honor. Our church leaders, I think, out of the people on this list, are often the people most starved for honor. I don't know if it's because we don't agree with them, because we feel they're not leading us in the right way, they're imperfect, what have you, but we're to honor our church leaders. Paul writes about Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2, verses 29 and 30. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And Paul would later write to Timothy that elders who serve well are worthy of double honor. Now this double honor might be uh, wages or whatever else. The point is we need to honor not just our elders, but our deacons, our ministers, all our leaders in the church Because not only are they deserving of it, because they're serving God on our behalf, but often they're the people most starved for it. May we honor our political, or excuse me, our church leaders. And lastly, honor up, honor down, honor all around. I don't know who said it, but I wish I did so I can give them credit. It doesn't matter your position. If they're above you and they're your boss and they're your leader, honor them. If they're your employees, your students, your children, honor them. If they're your peers, honor them. Honor everyone. We now know why we honor, and we know who we need to honor, but the difficult part with honor is what does honor look like? Well, here's... And it can look a multitude of different ways. Maybe, like in Bolivia, it looks like giving you extra food. Let's look at just four ways that we all can honor one another. The first, perhaps most obvious way, is with our words. Obviously. We can honor one another with our words. Words have an incredible power of building one another up. That's a lot of what Brandon was talking about on Tuesday with encouraging one another, and that's part of honor. When we recognize what we're doing, what others are doing, and does that not feel good? Have you ever been recognized for something, whether some in some stage like this or maybe just one-on-one? Man, does that not just carry you throughout your week or maybe even sometimes throughout your lifetime, right? We can honor one another with our words. A great example of this is Paul. In the same book that we had our scripture reading from in um, Romans, if we'll look in chapter 16, I won't read all of it, uh, but I would like to highlight a few. Paul honors many people. In verse 1, he honors Phoebe. He says she's a servant and that you are to welcome her in a worthy way of the saints. He talks about Priscilla and Aquila who risked their necks and Not only does he give thanks for them, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks for them. And Mary, who's worked hard. And he goes on. For the first 16 verses, essentially, Paul's just saying, greet this person because they've done this. Welcome this person because they've done this. And he does a great job at that. He honors people who've done great things. But what about, should we honor people who don't do great things necessarily? Well, Jesus did. Many of you are familiar with the story of the widow and the two mites. Isn't that such a small thing to us? She just gave money. Even if, she, even if we believe, yeah, she gave a lot based on how much she had, all she did was give money, right? That's a small thing. Well, not to Jesus it wasn't. Jesus, whether he pointed it out in front of many people in the temple courts or just his 12 disciples or maybe just Two disciples, as depicted here, it's not known, but the point is Jesus said, that's worthy of honor, and he talked her up. Man, we need to be honoring one another, whether we're cleaning toilets or whether we're planting churches. It's all worthy of honor if it's being done for the Lord. In the opposite vein, we honor one another by listening to one another. When... We, 
If someone comes to you for advice and asks you what you think and they listen to your advice, does that not feel good? It feels great. But not only that, does it not feel good when you have an opinion and you're sharing it with someone and they listen to you whether or not they agree? When we listen to one another, whether it's for advice or whether it's our opinions or whether we're just listening to stories they have, we honor them because we say, not only do I value the words that you're saying, but I value you, and I value you so much that I'm willing to listen to you, whether or not I agree with you. On the opposite side, have you ever had someone not listen to you? Maybe you were talking and they just cut you off and started talking to someone else or they just walked away. Is that not heartbreaking and or infuriating? May we not be people who do that. May we be people who listen intently and honor one another in that way. How many people, we hear about it a lot, how many people out there have no one to listen to them? Whether it's that their family has passed away or they moved to a new place and they haven't met anyone yet. How many lonely people are there out in this world who just need someone to listen to them? And how many of those lonely people are in our church? May we never have people who lack a person who will listen to them. May we be people who always honor one another in our listening. We could also honor one another by deferring to one another, and that is letting one another have their way. God's kingdom is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. In fact, God says, let them have their way. How, well, excuse me. First, let's read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, a passage I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. I'm sure he's saying a multitude of different things here, but one thing that I get from that is, look, you don't always have to have your way, right? It doesn't always have to be the way you want to do it. How many of our problems in the church, in our marriages, how many church splits and divorces have come because the other each of you wouldn't give up your preference. You wouldn't give up your opinion. How many times do we argue about what color the carpet is or what time services start? Or in marriage, how many times do we argue about where we're going to eat or what movie we're going to watch or who cooked dinner or who does dishes? And just sometimes let them have their way, especially if it's in a preference. See, try this. Try this in your marriage, in your congregation, in your workplace, in your life, and see if it's not radically changed when you defer to one another. And lastly, <clears throat> we honor one another by our presence. This sounds exceptionally arrogant, right? I'm going to honor you with my presence. Well, that's, that's not what I mean, necessarily. When... We show up, when we are there for people, we show them just how much they mean to us, how much we value them. And a great example of this was Jesus. In this picture with Zacchaeus, did he not honor Zacchaeus by going to his house? Did he not honor the woman at the well by sitting with her and talking with her? And how many others, countless people, knew their value and knew their worth because Jesus was there and sat with them. Another example is my mom. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I never understood this as many things from your childhood. I never understood. My mom would make me go to every single funeral. Any funeral that was at Southwest Church of Christ, we were there. And I've been to maybe, seriously, 20 to 25 funerals, and I've known two people who've passed away, honestly, but my mom didn't go for the dead. My mom went for the living. <clears throat> we went to show whether those people knew we were there or not, we were there for them. We loved them. <clears throat> but don't only, and I'm sure you have stories like that too, don't only go for the bad. Go for the good too. 
Man, how many, how good does it feel if you played sports or did theater or did 4-H or did whatever else when you looked down the crowd and saw someone who loved you cheering you on? Be there for all those things. Be there for the good <clears throat> and be there for the bad. Honor one another by being there. And there's a lot to honoring one another. <clears throat> it's a big task that we have before us. But it's one that's more than worthy of our time. The bottom line is that we should honor everyone, regardless of our position, of our political affiliation, of our personality, whatever. We honor everyone. And we've seen that honoring can be very small things. It could be as simple as listening to one another or letting your brother or sister have their way or just being there. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best not to cry. I get very emotional. Uh, but at that same children's home, I'm just going to show it up real quick so that I don't have to stand here and hold it and risk crying. <laughs> but at that same children's home, when I left, uh, the kids threw me a going away party. And they drew me these. I have maybe 15 or 16 at home. I didn't bring all of them, of course. Um, and, man, for that going away party, all they, they used their own money, and they bought lunch, and they drew me those, and they just uh, told me how much they were going to miss me, how much they loved me. And <clears throat> never have I been more honored. It's such a small way. <clears throat> and I'm sure many of you have things like this, Bibles or watches or whatever else, that people honored you with. And man, I didn't even need to get on the plane to go home. I could have just flown home myself. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff carries us. We carry those honors with us for our whole lives. <clears throat> Take a second and imagine what the church would look like if we truly practiced this. Man, I hope we strive each and every moment for that, that the church would be like that. <clears throat> May we honor one another in this way until we're called before the throne of our king, and he honors us with the highest honor of all. Well done, good and faithful servant.